In the fall, we're going to work with um, the Red Hook Historical Society with Claudine Close on a uh, joint Veterans Day ceremony to, to commemorate some of the fabulous letters that we have that were written from the 150th Regiment to Rhinebeck and Red Hook. Uh, it's going to be a great event in the fall. So we have a lot of fun things. Watch the newsletter and uh, come to some of our events. We're looking forward to it. So now we have James Chapman. I want to thank you for this wonderful party. And uh, James is going to talk a little bit about that, that history of the uh, hotel. James. Oh my goodness, this is fairly daunting. There's a lot of people here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, historical research. It's painstaking. It's painstaking. Detailed. Endless researching through archives, documents, endless stumbling upon what it is we are trying to discover and be able to explain. So I would like to say thank you to Cynthia Owen Phillip for doing all of that here for us tonight <laughs> in her wonderful book, Rhinecliff, A Hudson River History which I have stolen from in large amount and with not the greatest of accuracy, truthfully, also. So, if C Cynthia, you're not here tonight, are you? Thank heavens, at least I'll have a slight, <laughs> a slight reprieve when she starts correcting all my mistakes. So, I will apologize in advance if you came expecting a, a detailed historic treatise of the history of Rhinecliff and the hotel. Um, I can but disappoint, I'm afraid, what I will offer is a light-hearted uh, little summary of the area and how it came to be and the hotel and its little history. Uh, and hopefully if you drink enough, it may be mildly <laughs> tolerable. <laughs> I think it is important to uh, frame the history of the area and uh, you know, how we come to be here, as it is um, such a you know, historically interesting and, you know, uh, vibrant uh, area, particularly that we have here. If you go back 8,000 years, there were native Indians living here. The great Lenap, Lenape tribe, is that, is that the right expression? 8,000 years ago, they were here hunting, fishing, doing their thing, and so on. They had a river crossing, right, even then, in this area, that went backwards and forwards across, across to uh, Kingston, probably for the uh, Chinese buffet, which was... <laughs> Founded a long time ago, but <laughs> of course the first, this gives you a taste of what's to come, <laughs> of course the earliest settlers uh, in the Hudson River and in this area were Dutch, Dutch people. Um, in 1664, a little group of uh, Dutch people based in uh, Kingston bought from the Indians a nice swathe of uh, land over here. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a great little description of, of what they paid for it in Cynthia's book here. So they bought all this land that we now call Rhinecliff and the surrounding area and goes for sale in these uh, expensive lots and so on. They sold it for six buffaloes, four blankets, five kettles, four guns, five horns, five axes, ten cans of powder, eight shirts, eight pairs of stockings, forty fathoms, of wampum, two drawing knives, two adzes, ten knives, half an anchor of rum, and one frying pan. <laughs> As we all know, that even. <laughs> <No. laughs> five golden rings. Yeah. We all know that wouldn't even pay the rent for one month on one of Richard Kobyshansky's houses in the area <laughs> these days. <laughs> so, originally the area was Dutch. Indeed. Um, unfortunately, in 1664, the British sent four ships to 
to the place that, we, that was called New Amsterdam, uh, right at the end of which Manhattan down there in those times. Uh, obviously, they sent them on a kind of a friendly meet and greet mission to meet the locals. Um, the Dutch surrendered and the English uh, <laughs> British took over and uh, named the place New York after the, uh, one of the bosses of the mission, who was James, Duke of York. I never knew that until I read that recently. So that's where the name came from. Yeah. Um, further up the river in 1686, similar kind, not, not far off in time, um, these four Dutch, four Dutch people who were living across the river at the time bought this parcel of land over here um, and they recognised that it was a great spot being in the middle of um, the Hudson River and all that was developing at that time. There was a strong fur trade going on that was based in Albany in the north, all the furs were coming into Albany and coming, um, coming south down the river to uh, um, New York which was becoming a, a strong international port in those days. So as time developed, this little area here became the fourth major settlement um, on the Hudson River after Albany, New York City and Kingston, this little spot here was number four. So I thought that was, I didn't realize that. So we were, we were there at the beginning. Now, this little spot here became known as Kipsbergen after one of the, the Dutch who bought it, his name, there was a couple of brothers, um, Hendricus and Jacob. Jacob Kip ended up, being the, ended up being, I think, the first settler here, and so it was named uh, Kipsbergen. Um, and that was the first true beginnings of the little spot of Rhinecliffe here. Then, from there on, it's had an interesting uh, history. Into the, things developed and the community developed. Um, in the late 1700s, there was an unfortunate misunderstanding they call the American Revolution. <laughs> Make one of that what you will. And early in October of 1977, a whole group of English ships pulled up right outside here. Obviously, in October, they were leaf peeping here to enjoy the scenery. No doubtless trying to go to the Sheep and Wool Festival. <laughs> Unfortunately, they got off on the wrong side of the river in their disappointment that they couldn't go to the Sheep and Wool Festival. After all, they burnt Kingston to the ground. <laughs> Some could say that was a little excessive. Other ones could say accidents may happen. <laughs> However, suffice to say that very shortly afterwards, General uh, Burgoyne had his proverbial backside kicked just up the road in Saratoga um, um, by General, I've forgotten his name now. But anyway, from then on, <laughs> yeah, another General. It was, uh, it was, uh, it, it was, it was, yeah, Gates, Horatio, Horatio Gates. Yeah. So it was down, uh, downhill from there for the British, that's for sure. Um, okay. Now, shortly after that, as America settled into its newfound uh, situation and so on. In this area, there, there came a, um, a bunch of transport revolutions, which really changed uh, the nature of this area. The first one was a thing called the Salisbury Turnpike. Has anybody heard of that? Mm -hmm. It's actually a road that ran from Salisbury in Connecticut right across to right here in Rhinecliffe. Uh, so that became a major source of commerce coming westwards. That was called, uh, right by Long Dock is where it um, terminated. And it actually had a toll house on it. Imagine that. Apparently they had Easy Pass 2 in those days. <laughs> it was available online, but not many people took advantage. In 1807, the age of steam began. And all these lovely steamboats started going up and down the river carrying all the trade and materials and things up and down, and it was a stopping here for boats also. Canals started to be built too. The Erie Canal was built further up the river, and that connected through to the Great Lakes. But what most affected this little spot here was the Delaware and Hudson Canal, which popped out right uh, at the es Esopus across there, and that brought coal from Pennsylvania right through to here. Esopus. Esopus. 
Beg your pardon. We'll be back. Just. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the Delaware Canal brought coal from Pennsylvania. Then in 1851, the biggest revolution of all came to Little Kipsbergen. Who can guess what that was? The train. Yes. The Hudson River Railroad came shooting north from uh, New York City and obviously created a whole load of commerce as it headed north um, up, the river, up the river. The stop here was still called the Kipsbergen Station in those days. And it was a big terminus because of all the other stuff that was going on here. And there was a ferry that went across the river also. So there were four tracks here back in the old days. There's old postcards that have got that show you these, uh, you know, the size of the station that was here in those days. Um, and in those days, Rhinecliff was like some form of a bawdy sea seaport um, in those days. Apparently there were about seven bars dotted up the road here, several little hotels uh, in some of the buildings that were along here, one of them being, if anyone knows, Bruce, Mur Bruce Murphy's little house right at the top of Schatzel there, that was a hotel way back in those days. Also in 1854, opened this little spot here. This was called the Rhinecliffe Hotel, even then. And it was designed by an architect called George Veitch, who did a lot of designing in the area. If you take the Amtrak south, you can see there's a building that looks exactly the same uh, as this on the other side, a big white building only about, I don't know, 15 minutes down from here on the other side of the river, uh, almost exact in composition. This building was a classic example of the kind of style of Rhinecliffe architecture that developed the steeply eaved roofs, um, clapboard sidings, stone foundations, um, and cedar-shaped cedar -shake roof is what this building had um, initially, although a lot of people remember it for its tin roof. That didn't go on till uh, later, which we discovered when we ripped off the tin roof and found the cedar shakes still sitting there rotting underneath, which they'd obviously <laughs> yeah, it just covered it straight over. Um, so this, uh, the hotel opened and was a, a rooming house for people visiting the area, getting off the train or however they were coming and coming here to do their business, staying overnight in the tavern. There was a stable at the back of the hotel um, and these people were called drummers, was their nickname, of the people who came to the area, a lot of these business people, because they were drumming up their business. <laughs> so that's what they called these people. Now in those days there was an awful lot of business uh, and commerce going up and down the Hudson River, all different kinds of things. Some of the major uh, commerce that was going on, uh, there were whaling stations, it's hard to imagine, but whales used to get, be pulled up and processed on the Hudson River. Brickworks, which are still dotted around. Uh, flowers were a big thing, especially obviously here in Rhinebeck. Um, bluestone. Most of New York City and Brooklyn, the, blue, the bluestone was quarried from around here in the Catskills and shipped down on barges. Um, and ice harvesting for all those cocktails that they were drinking in New York City was all harvested up here, stored in big warehouses, and shipped all the way through the year back down to the city. So there was an enormous lot of uh, commerce going on um, all through that time in this area. Um, the hotel was plodding along, doing its business. One of the legends that I've heard many times is that Lincoln's funeral train stopped here. Um, I understand it's a fact that, it's, that it did stop here, the legend is that uh, the poor president was needing a little bit of a sheet change uh, after his long trip and that sheets from the hotel were taken over so the uh, physician could uh, wrap him up and give him a bit of a fresh, <laughs> bit of a fresh look. So that's uh, a story that, that I've heard several times. Um, there are very, all kinds of stories about things that have gone on here. There's a great little story that Babe Ruth came to visit one time and uh, some local kid. Apparently local kids used to go over on the station and carry bags for people over the bridge to come to the hotels up here. And there's a story that some kid picked up Babe's Ruth 
Babe Ruth's bags and carried him over to stay at the hotel here. That's one I've heard several times. Um, there are also stories of ghosts in the building. Um, apparently there was a wedding couple who stayed here on their wedding night. Unfortunately, <laughs> the husband died on the same night, which wasn't a great start. Um, and apparently he roams, still roams the area in great distress, understandably. Um, <laughs> but we have, have you? sorry? Have you met him? Thankfully I haven't, but I've had people who are sensitive to those things walk through the building and say, yeah, this one's sitting over there, she's sitting over there. So I close my eyes to it, but I kind of believe it's... How, uh, how many years ago was this? This was early this century, I believe. Uh -huh. that's, that's what I understand. Okay. Yeah. The last century. I, th I think, yes, yes, of the 1900s, yeah. yeah. So, um, the hotel here has had a... When we, when we bought the hotel, um, we researched the D's a little and so on, and there are various names. Not that many old owners on. Uh, McElroy was one of the first owners. Uh, Steinmetz was an owner of the hotel early this century, and the Steinmetz uh, family still have relations in the area. I don't know if anybody knows the McDonald's or Sandy Bell, a very nice lady. She lives in Connecticut now, but she came back to visit not so long ago. Um, those of you, many of you will probably know, uh, in 1946, the hotel was bought by Ed and Ruth Tybus. Um, and apparently they bought it from Ed, had some uh, money that he, he'd got from uh, being in the uh, army and so on. Uh, and they, had, they made a nice little hotel, apparently. They used to do weddings, parties, clam bakes, all kinds of fun. And they had a nice little restaurant that was upstairs. There was a small parlor room upstairs. I don't know if any of you ever came in the old days. The, the upstairs room above here was split into three different uh, parlor rooms. And one of them was a, a small restaurant for a long time. Uh, and I've got a few pictures that I'll pass around afterwards for, for, for you to look at that you can see some of these different rooms and so on. Um, the interesting point uh, along the way in terms of the hotel was when Ed, sometime along the way, apparently in the late 70s or 80s, Ed discovered music. And Ed realized that there was a market and he could sell more beer by having music in here. So Ed started to begin a whole music cult here. Uh, and, the, and the place became famous, or infamous, depending on how you want to look at it, as being a musical venue, a place for people to come, jump around, have a good time. Uh, certainly it was famous for its flexible approach to the licensing laws, and <laughs> so. But certainly, it was a well-known music venue, and a lot of little bands traveled all over the country and came stopped at the, at the Rhinecliff Hotel and played. So, whether you liked it or not, the place was infamous in its own way. A lot of people loved it. A lot of the locals didn't quite love it so much with all the noise and the uh, police visits and so on. <laughs> but it certainly made a mark. That was, that was for sure. Um, various, all, there were stories of all different musical famous people playing here. Who knows how many of them are true? I've heard so many. For sure, Pete Seeger has played here several times along the way. Natalie Merchant used to live just behind the ceremony in Rhinecliff. She played here several times also. And there's various others that, that I'm not gonna mention because I don't, I don't know if they're true or not, who knows. Um, eventually, the Orwellian forces of the town of Rhinebeck banded together <laughs> and issued a list of zoning violations to the hotel back in 1983 that effectively, Ed, there was no way he could fix all these things. They, they basically pointed out everything that was wrong with the building and forced, basically forced him to close. Not at, out of um, an act of, of meanness. Um, and I remember I spoke, you know, I spoke to several people in the town who told me that they, various people in the town had become worried that there was, just, there was going to be an accident or a fire or something bad was going to happen. So that's why, you know, the, the kind of the, the, uh, it had been allowed to just carry on for a long time, but eventually it was deemed this was, uh, had to stop, something had to be done. 
So, in uh, 2003, the sign went up on the, on the, on the front door and, uh, and the building had to close. Now, prior to that, there were two foolish young, let's call them weekenders, <laughs> who used to come up on the train here. And one of them had a little house around the back in Rhinecliff, right next to Natalie Merchant. And she, she invited us for coffee one day there. I forgot about that. But anyway, and uh, we used to get off the train and we, uh, and we used to think, look, we've got to go and have a drink in that goofy hotel. We have to. So we would come in the bar and we would play hotel, play pool, jump around in the back with the 15-year-olds uh, for, for a little bit of fun. And while we were lying on a pool of beer on the floor, we would look at and we would say, somebody should do something with this place one day. Look, look at this place. Um, so, purely by chance, um, after the, the place was closed down by the town, my brother noticed a very um, prestigious advert had been placed in the Wantad Digest, um, which caught his attention. <laughs> After that, we realized that one of the great scandals of Rhinebeck had occurred when a local realtor, let's call him Dan Staley. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dan. <laughs> Sold us the building as, I think his words were, promising business concern, <laughs> full of opportunity. So we took the bait, bought the place, and thought, We'll come in, paint the walls, and open up a little restaurant or something next year. No problem. So, <laughs> of course, we uh, came in and uh, brought, got our, uh, an engineer, local engineer, to come along and uh, take a look at the, the downstairs here. Very quickly, he ran out of the building, <laughs> instructed us to close the area off, uh, and, in hire, and hire a firm to go back in there and put structural supports and make everyone wear hard hats before the whole thing came down and fell into the river. So, from that point, that was when we started to realize that things were changing slightly from what we, uh, what we, <laughs> what we had imagined. Um, the first... Uh, thing we were instructed to do by, by our lovely engineers was to support the whole building on a, I don't know what to call it, an array, an army of eight by eight posts so that we could replace the stone foundation of which that was a part of it there. Um, whilst they worked out the structural uh, integrity of the building above. So we spent uh, six months replacing the raggedy stone foundation with uh, big eight by eight posts. And I don't know if anyone remembers, I'm sure some of the locals used to come down and look in those days. You could look right through here because it was just big posts holding the, holding the whole building up with nothing underneath. So of course, eventually after six months, the engineers came back to us and said, well, it's great that you've held it all up like this, but we've actually worked out that the top half is not actually worth holding up after all. So, <laughs> So we're suggesting that you replace that piece by piece also. So, uh, so we thought, great, there's another win for the project. <laughs> Things are going well. Um, shortly after that, um, our good friend, um, and greatly missed actually, Al Dinger, I'm sure many of you know Al, um, came, down, came, came down, and I'll, I'll say Al was a great friend to us, and really, truly. <laughs> He was a great, a great friend to us all along the way. But Al had been obliged to come down and stick a rather large stop work notice <laughs> on, uh, on the side of the building. When, uh, I'm sure the, the planning board had noticed that our small renovation of an uh, existing structure had started to become a massive rebuild of something uh, a lot more than we'd ever intended. So... Um, the, uh, the town was very nice to us, I would say. We had some very civilized meetings, worked out what we had to do, closed up the building, um, and there began, if those of you remember, the Tyvek, Tyvek phase, <laughs> when we wrapped the building in a beautiful white cloud of Tyvek, and it sat here for two years, looking just like that as we uh, 
went into the planning and zoning process and uh, did what we had to do. At that time, we we never heard of planning, zoning, EPA, Aitzen River Heritage, nothing. We didn't know anything. So we we end, went into a big learning curve. We discovered uh, the word variance. The, <laughs> 13 of them we had and fought our way through uh, the planning board, the zoning board, the town board on various occasions. We discovered along the way that we were blessed. Uh, oh, desserts, right, does that mean we can finish? <laughs> we discovered uh, that this little spot here fell into about just every protected zone you could possibly imagine. We were on the historic register of places. This is a national heritage landmark zone. We were on a protected river zone. Um, and it just went on and on and on. So it, w it was a long, long process. But what I will say um, certainly is that we are... Uh, <laughs> what was heartening was that at the beginning we started this project, we knew nobody, and I think everyone, people were looking at us thinking, who are these two strange weirdos here? What, what are they doing? What are they planning to do? But by the time we'd finished, we'd come to know everybody, um, and people were actively, actively supporting us towards the end of it. People would drive by outside, my brother and I would be out there laying bricks, and people would be honking the horn and saying, don't give up, don't give up, keep going. <laughs> And it's true to say that in the end, the town of Rhinebeck were very, very kind to us. Uh, after year after year of saying, next year we'll be ready. Okay, next year we'll be ready. Next year we'll be ready. In the end, uh, we booked a wedding in May of uh, 2008, as I felt that was the only way to force the issue. Uh, and it was a lovely local couple, if anyone knows the Totmans, very lovely couple, um, um, and uh, <laughs> so we booked the wedding, and of course we got closer and closer at the time, and every time the family would come in and we'd say, well, it still needs some work, but we, th we, we could see you, yeah, we're, we're confident you're going to be ready, until of course uh, four weeks before I was begging all over the town, please help us, please help us, and uh, it's very fair to say that everybody in the town probably helped us a whole lot more than they should have in uh, getting the permits and the permissions we needed to actually finish this damn thing and get open. So, um, um, and, I, and I often say that many people say, say to us, those aw the awful town of Rhinebeck, they were so bad to you. They don't realize the truth is the awful town of Rhinebeck was very, very nice to us and helped us get this plan. We could have been tied up in planning for five years uh, quite easily if we hadn't, uh, 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 you know, hadn't been lucky. So, eventually, uh, we uh, finished the planning process and we uh, started the, uh, the proper building process of the, of the whole building. We ripped out anything that was useful and uh, reusable and nice. Um, the local community benefited in many ways <laughs> along the way. I'm going to name the names here, Tim O'Brien. His, his house is full of our structural beams, God bless him, and they're looking beautiful. Um, Bob Mackay, we know that you've got a lot of our bricks there. What did you build, a walkway? <laughs> um, um, Richard Kolbyshansky has got a lot of lovely um, um, beams in the house on the corner. The business rules house is full of our, our structural beams there. Uh, David Borenstein, our architect, built um, a barn using our siding out in Milan. So there's a, there's a big barn out there, sided by the Rhinecliffe Hotel. <laughs> uh, if anyone knows Paul Buckler, he, bought a, he built a very nice barbecue pit with all our bricks up at his house. Um, but inside the building here, we were lucky enough that we had the time to reuse a lot of the old materials. The floor here, these are all original floorboards that came out of the hotel. Uh, this was foundation stone uh, from the hotel. All the heavy wood beams that you can see around, like those over there, uh, were, the, were structural beams from the hotel. 
the wooden, most of these wooden tables here were made from beams uh, that came out of the hotel, the, um, the ones where you can see the beams there. The bar there is original. Uh, you can see at the side of it, the ice box is the original ice box that's been here a long, long time. Um, outside, there's a brick walkway. That was the original chimney stack that went all the way to the top here and that was deemed unsafe again, so we had to bring it all down and then we built a walkway around the outside with it. Um, so we were lucky in some ways that we um, had so much time that we were able to, to, to reuse all the, the, these things um, to you know, hopefully make, make, the place, make, make the place nice. The truth of the matter is that in terms of structure, this is a new building now. All the structural fabric of the building um, is new. It's all very serious joists and steel and all kinds of things, things to hold the place up. But we put back all the finishes so that hopefully it looks um, like, it, uh, like, like, it, like it should look. Yeah, and certainly the shape uh, and all the, uh, the outside of the building, thanks to the good work of the planning board, is exactly as it was. We were very much obliged to keep the building looking like it, like it was, always was, with the same style of windows, the same style of roof, um, and so on. So um, hopefully it uh, reflects uh, what, it, what, it, what its history is. So eventually we came to open in um, 2008, and we opened ourselves as a little boutique country hotel. We always wanted it to be a nice place, hopefully that the community could use and enjoy and sing at Elaine and uh, do nice things. Um, and we've worked hard to, uh, you know, hopefully make it a nice place for people to enjoy. It's been a, a long road for us, that's for sure. It's nine years now that we've been working, that we've been working on this. There were times when we, many times when we ran out of money didn't have anything left, what do we do now? Because certainly we never planned um, a $5 million renovation. We certainly didn't have the money for that renovation. Um, the interesting thing is that my brother uh, is a software programmer and uh, he, wor <laughs> he's, he worked at JP Morgan for a long time on uh, software, credit risk software. Obviously, it wasn't very good. <laughs> Given the state of the world these days. But in a perverse way, when he sold his software company, that's, in truthfully, that's what saved us and allowed us to finish this project. So I would like to say a small thank you to Wall Street and all the gods on there. <laughs> so that's a true story, actually. So, along the way now, we've been open for four years. Um, we've tried our best to make things work. For most of the time, we've been think that, the, thinking that we may well apply for 5013C status. Uh, as we, <laughs> we certainly seem to be an eternal non-profit organization. <laughs> the good news, I will say, that thankfully, a couple of years ago, we discovered that despite the recession, a lot of people are still getting married uh, and and I will say without question that thankfully we've built a very great wedding business and it's great because people come here get married and have a great time but truthfully uh, it's it's all our lovely weddings that are keeping us alive and allowing us to be here right now so for anyone who said those horrible people there all they do is weddings and this and that well please the weddings are allowing us to just be here in time we will do everything we can but our lovely weddings are, are really what's, what's keeping us alive right now, that's for sure. So, that is, I think, more than I should have said, probably. <laughs> I hope, Robbie, please don't complain about the food. Please. No, no, <laughs> it's actually something you shouldn't mention and get Look, please. with food, but you did not mention the supper. I try not to think about that, but um, yeah, unfortunately, this being possibly one of the tiniest lots in Rhinecliff, there was no way for us to have a septic field unless we made China Rose our septic field. <laughs> so we were. That's a debatable question, but I think it's great, personally. But uh, 
we were obliged to create to build our own uh, wastewater treatment system. So at the top there, at the top of the hill where we have the sheds and the enclosed area, we've got our own little uh, bio system bubbling away and, and eventually discharges into the river, strangely enough. But yeah, it, and that's, that is checked and monitored every day by a licensed uh, professional checking the levels of what, what we're producing going out into the river. But yes, that was... Uh, we ended up buying what we thought was a spaceship. That's what it looked like on the plans, Robbie. So that was a, a big uh, issue for us. We had no idea that was coming. We had no idea. No. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. What are your plans for the future? What are our plans for the future? Nothing. For the hotel? Yeah. Pretty simple. The hotel. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, we want to just keep it going uh, uh, as it's going. The, the, the wedding and event business is doing great. Um, the rooms are doing very nicely. Uh, they're full every weekend. We wish we had more rooms, but I think the chances of us building any more rooms on top are next to zero, probably. <laughs> but uh, what we do want to do uh, is, is get the restaurant, get some life back into the restaurant. Because we know that in the last year, we've neglected the restaurant a little truthfully in order to allow us to uh, build the wedding business in order to make sure that we're still here but our big mission actually for next year is to put life back into the restaurant have more music Elaine so we'll speak right away about the schedule for you um, but yeah we want to put all the life back into the restaurant that we had a great first year uh, and we want to get all that energy and the events and all the fun stuff uh, that we used to do in the restaurant, the goofy events we used to do, and dinners, market dinners and everything. We want to do a whole whole lot more of that. So that's, that's really all we want to do. Yeah. Thanks, do cool. many of your guests use the launch? Um, a few. A few. Yes, yeah, some people, you know, have, have taken it and gone over to Kingston. Um, I think it's great. I think the launch is a great thing. Um, yeah, the little, the little ferry launch. I think it's very tough for poor Sandy Henny who runs it. It must be so tough to make it profitable. So I, God bless her for persevering. Uh, but I think it'll be great if, if everyone can you know, stick with it. And the idea is hopefully at some point to build a, a proper some kind of little shuttle that goes into Rhinebeck that connects with it so that people can come over to here and then go into Rhinebeck and come back. And uh, that, that's the, and I know, uh, Tom Trout has been very help, helpful in trying to talk about that. that. So I, I think it's a great thing. I think it's a great thing. And, yeah, and she really perseveres with it, so I think it's great. <coughs> I have a question. How much uh, uh, traffic do you get here from Red Hook? Do, do you mean guests? The foreign country. <laughs> <laughs> Northern people. Foreign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We get a lot of traffic from Red Hook, okay. very much so. I think, uh, I think, you know, I think this whole area is one big connected thing, and people, you know, traffic between here, Red Hook. Um, the traffic is connected. Yeah. It's all connected, yeah. And across the Woodstock, I think this is one big area that people are all, uh, you know, socialize and go out to dinner in and, and so on. So, and I think it's a great spot. The whole area is, is a great spot. Do you guys do anything with Omega? Um, nothing structured. Really, they have a lot, Omega have a lot of um, accommodation themselves. So um, I think, truthfully, the cab drivers are the ones who really do yeah. great from Omega. <laughs> it's about a $30 ride either yeah. way. But yeah, we're too far, really, from Omega to, to, to be a, you know, much of a help to what they do. How many rooms do you have? Just nine. In the old hotel, they had about there were at least 16 rooms, very small rooms. Each one had a, a little uh, wood-burning stove. We could see the, the burn marks on the walls when we did the demolition. So each room had its own little wood-burning stove, and there was a shared bathroom at the end of the corridor. Uh, so, but we just opened it up to make the rooms you know, a lot bigger. So we just, we just have nine. In hindsight, I wish, you know, we would have done more if we could have. Yeah. Do we have any uh, upcoming events, big events, other than the 
winter solstice bonfire on the dock. The winter solstice bonfire on the dock, which yes. is on which date is that? It's Friday. That's obviously the biggest the event on the social calendar the coming up. Um, we have we have a few events coming up next. Uh, our biggest our big thing in the winter is Burns Night. Has anyone been to Burns Night? Oh. It's absolutely, as the Scottish would say, it's a hoot. <laughs> but it's a toast to Robbie Burns, the the Scottish poet, um, and it's a lot of fun. It's just bagpipes and kilts and haggis. That's uh, that's on February the first, and we do it right here. With we do a big. Uh, Scottish dinner, and then there's toasts to Robbie Burns. Cynthia Phillip, a couple of times, has done one of the toasts. Do you serve haggis? We sir, we make our own haggis you for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's a great night. If what that, you that's on February the first. It's a really, it's a fun night. It's the real. We get a lot of real kilts that night. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think. That's enough for me. David's hovering, so thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, uh. I want to thank James Chapman so much for having us here tonight and uh, giving us a great talk about the history of Rhinecliff. And on behalf of the board of the Rhinebeck Historical Society, I want to wish you and your families a wonderful and happy holiday and a wonderful and happy new year. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you.